Hey, welcome to Westbridge Church. My name is Jeremiah. I'm one of the pastors here, and it's awesome to have you with us here in the building. I want to say hello to everybody who's uh, joining us on our online campus as well. I also want to shout out to our microsites that are joining us. Uh, I know we have one in Big Lake joining us, and uh, any other microsites that are uh, participating, awesome to have you with us. And uh, man, uh, great to be here with you. Uh, We are in week two of a series called uh, This Beautiful Mess, but before we jump into that, I want to let you know that every once in a while, every once in a great while, maybe once a year, I'll get a call or a text some point during the week and say, hey, we're looking for uh, drummers, but you might have to fill in this week, and I just want you to know we're in really bad shape if I ever get that text. Because I'm like the backup to 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 the backup drummer. So... If that ever happens, I just want to let you know, we need a few more drummers. So if you are somebody or you're sitting there and you're like, man, it would be really cool. I know I'm a drummer. It'd be fun to play in that band. If you ever had that thought, uh, you should run with that. We would love to have you. We would love to have you come and uh, show us your skills because uh, we, are, we're, we have a, we, uh, our, sort of our schedule of drummers. Uh, we're, we're a little bit thin in that department. So if you're like, man, I think I could do that. I think I could participate in that. This would be a great way to use the gifts that God's given you and, uh, and participate here at Westbridge Church. So if that's you, if you're watching online, if you're uh, here in the room and you're like, dude, I'm a sick drummer and nobody even knows that, then uh, please come and talk to us. We would love to connect with you. So that's just to kick things off. Now, we're in the second week of a series called This Beautiful Mess. And the idea behind this series is that we all deal with people on a regular basis. And it's the people in our lives, it's the relationships in our lives that uh, are the best part of our lives. They are the most beautiful part of our lives. And also, simultaneously, oftentimes the messiest parts of our lives, right? They're also the parts that uh, tend to cause us the most frustration, and the parts that get the messiest are the misunderstandings we have with each other, the words we use with each other. Uh, and so this whole series, the goal of this series is for us to, uh, is to give us some things that we can do to make our relationships with each other a little bit more beautiful and a little bit less messy. That's the goal of this series, because at the end of the day, that's the most important part of our lives. And that means that even if you're not a follower of Jesus— If you're kind of exploring things, you can apply what we're talking about through this series and you can put these practices into place and it will make your marriage better and it'll make your relationship with your kids better. And I'm convinced it'll make your workplace even more productive and uh, it'll make your uh, workplace a better place to work and it'll make your neighborhood a nicer neighborhood and it'll make your community a more unified community if you'll put some of the things into practice that we're talking about during this series. But for followers of Jesus, there's even more at stake. Because Jesus told his disciples, his last season that he was with them, really the last uh, day that he was with them before he was arrested, he told them uh, some very specific things that we would be known for. In fact, here's what Jesus said, gave them pretty clear instructions. He said, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. And so this is supposed to be what the church of Jesus is famous for. That this is how you're supposed to know that there's a church in the community, is that there's a group of people who are so good at loving one another well. And that when you you interact with these people, you go, man, I don't know what I believe about Jesus. I don't know what I believe about church or God or faith. But when I interact with these people, they are the nicest group of people. They love really well. There's something different about the way that they love. And Jesus said, this is what's going to mark you as my disciples, as my followers, by how you treat the people in your life. And while this is what has attracted so many people to church throughout history, it's also true that this is something that's very easy to lose sight of. It's something that's very easy for us as the church, and we've seen this historically, to uh, lose sight of that command. And it's very easy for us to turn this into a command that we sort of nod and agree with in church and then walk out the doors and don't always apply to our lives. And so during this series, we're talking about the words that we speak to each other and the conflicts that we have with each other and the narratives that we sort of write in our own minds that we tell about each other. And so if we could sort of begin some of these practices that we're talking about during this series or resume some of these practices or maybe even accelerate some of these practices, we could actually be famous for what Jesus wants us to be famous for, how we treat each other, loving really well. So last week we talked about our words, and I want to encourage you, if you missed last week, go back and check it out. It's all online. Today we're going to talk about our conflicts. 
And not just our conflicts that sort of uh, pop up and then they go away. I want to talk about the conflicts that linger, the conflicts that tend to stick around, the ones that last. I want to talk about our grudges, our grudges. Now, uh, in 1882, there was a guy named Joseph Richardson who owned a piece of land in New York City. And this piece of land was 104 feet by 5 feet. Really odd piece of land. And as they were building roads and putting in the streets in uh, New York City, and uh, as they were sort of subdividing things, he had inherited this. And so he had inherited this piece of land that was basically left over from where a road went through. And so it's 104 feet by 5 feet. Now, the person that owned the land next to them decided they were going to build an apartment building, and his name was uh, Hyman Sarner, and they owned the property adjacent to him, and they decided they were going to build property. And so this is kind of wasted land, right? A five-foot-wide five uh, uh, five plot of land by 104 feet deep. And so they offered to buy it from him for, at the time, $1,000. And uh, Joseph Richardson was so insulted by that offer because he wanted $5,000 for it that he decided, this is before building codes, he decided, you know what? That is so insulting that I'm actually going to build a house on that land. So he built a five-story apartment building, 104 feet long and five feet wide. (laughs) Then just to stick it to Hyman Sarner, he moved in. And he lived there for the rest of his life until he died 15 years later. Now think about that for just a second. Here's a picture of this house. This is absolutely incredible. The building is the the whole building. And then the little attachment on the end is the house that he built. And over the years, this became known as the Richardson Spite House. It's just a spite house. He just built it just to spite him and moved in and lived and died there. Man, he showed him, didn't he? And here's what's fascinating. These spite houses actually show up all over the United States. There's different spite houses that are built in all kinds of, uh, for all kinds of different reasons. There's different things that people have done. In fact, there's a story of a guy in Detroit who uh, bought the house next door to his ex-wife and had a massive statue of a middle finger constructed on his deck pointing right at her backyard. Man, he got her. And it's amazing, isn't it, what people do just to spite somebody else. They build this entire thing, and it's this huge monument. And yet, at the end of his life, guess who suffered the most as a result of that? It it wasn't Hyman Sarner, the guy who built the apartment complex next door. It was Joseph Richardson. He's the one who suffered more than anybody. And it's amazing. We, We think about this and we go, that's just ludicrous that somebody would go to such great lengths to build something to make a point. And yet... If we're honest, sometimes we do the same thing. We build a a spite house in our own hearts. We build a monument to the pain that someone has caused us, to a hurt that somebody has inflicted on us. And a grudge is really a spite house that we've built in our own hearts and in our own minds. And a grudge is simply getting mad and staying mad at someone. Right? And, and maybe it's just like everyday things, but we kind of carry it over from one day to the next. So, you know, your spouse snaps at you in front of your friends, and then they just have the audacity to go to bed without even so much as an apology or an acknowledgement. And you wake up the next morning, and you're both like, hey, and she's, you know, one person says, good morning. You're like, morning. How's it going? Fine. All right, you're fine? Because you don't seem fine. Is something wrong? <laughs> well, if I have to tell you, then yeah. That's a grudge. Small grudge, but that's a grudge. Or, you know, you, your coworker talks about you behind your back, and then it, it makes its way to you, and you find out about it, and then now everything in your, like, you just see that person differently. And now for, for, for the next month, you're just like, oh, I'm going to show him. I'll show him, right? And, and you're trying to keep him out of meetings, and you're like, do these look like the sales numbers of someone who's not going to be around much longer? Randy? Or maybe, you know, someone says something about you on social media, and, and so now you're like, oh, you're 23 comments deep back and forth. You have friends crafting messages for you. You're like, oh, show up. Send. Oh, no, he didn't. Okay, okay. It's on. That's a grudge. 
All of these things are grudges. The dictionary definition of a grudge is this, a persistent feeling of ill will or resentment resulting from a perceived injury or offense. Think about that. And we, we all hold grudges uh, to some degree with the various people in our lives, some of us for days, some of us for weeks, some of us for years. We, we have an, an, a feeling of ill will or resentment that we carry towards someone because grudges feel good. At least for a little while, they feel good. They, they make us feel justified in the fact that somebody hurt me, and so now this makes me feel justified in the fact that I'm the victim and they're to blame. But here's the problem with grudges. First, they don't actually work. They just don't work, right? Some of you started holding a grudge against someone a few days ago or a few weeks ago or a few months ago, and it hasn't changed anything, has it? Nothing has changed. But second, I've never heard a happy grudge story. Have you? I've never, ever heard a happy grudge story. It's always detrimental to relationships. It's, it always causes harm to the relationship at the end of the day because getting mad at someone and staying mad at them doesn't just affect them, does it? It actually affects you. It actually affects you more than it affects them. You, you know you, you've constructed a, a spite house in your own mind when you start having imaginary conversations with them. You, maybe, you, maybe just me, uh, uh, but uh, I'm sure if you're anything like me, you've had some imaginary conversations with some people who have hurt you. And for me, you know, you, you, you sort of like role play it in your own mind. And, and I know that sometimes I have these imaginary conversations with people who have hurt me. And in those moments, I have the exact right thing to say. And man, it is a zinger. And it feels really good. And it's the perfect thing. And they're left standing there, just their jaw on the floor, just they have no comeback. And always in my scenario, probably not yours, but in mine, there's always a crowd of people around and they start to like slow clap. And they're like, yes, Jeremiah, Jeremiah. No, just me, okay. <laughs> but at the end of the day, <clears throat> what has your grudge actually done to the other person? Nothing hasn't changed anything for them. All it's done is hurt you. At the end of the day, how has your grudge actually affected them? It hasn't. It's affected you way more than it's affected them. And here's the reason for that. Here's some, some truths that we're going to look at about grudges today. And the first is this. The more you hold a grudge, the more it has a hold on you. Think about that. The more you hold a grudge, the more it has a hold on you. And this is why every single one of us has seen a grudge come between coworkers or neighbors or friends or family members. It's because there's been a serious uptick. Yeah, I mean, think about just in the last 18 months, there's been a serious uptick in persistent feelings of ill will or resentment resulting from a perceived injury or offense. In the last 18 months, maybe you were stacked in your home with, uh, you were working and your spouse was working and you're trying to educate your kids all at the same time and you're like, I'm not used to my spouse being around all the time. And there's a serious uptick in uh, feelings of ill will or resentment. Or maybe, uh, you know, as a nation, we face a health crisis, we face a racial crisis, a political crisis, and it seems like over the last 18 months, more than any other time in my life, and I already know it was kind of like this, so this has kind of been out there, but it feels like in the last 18 months, battle lines have just been drawn in every arena. In every arena of life, we're like, you're, you're either on this side or you're on that side. There is no middle ground. And it feels like battle lines have just been drawn in every single arena of life. We spent the last year being set up for and maybe even baited into holding grudges against other people. Holding grudges for something somebody said, for something somebody did, or even for a position they hold that doesn't agree with mine. We've been sort of baited into holding grudges. In fact, all of us on some level have maybe one or two grudges that we're holding on to. Somewhere along the way. And if we're honest, they're holding us back. They're hurting our relationships. They're stealing our joy. They're robbing our focus. They're disrupting our community. And they're undermining our influence. And deep down, if we're, if we're honest with ourselves, we know that's a problem. It's a problem. And the Apostle Paul actually talks about this. He's writing to a group of Jesus' followers living in the city of Ephesus. And the Apostle Paul was a guy who had this incredible encounter with Jesus, and his life was dramatically changed. 
We've said this so many times that when people encounter Jesus, they change. There's almost nobody that encountered Jesus in life, their life wasn't changed. And Paul was a guy who his life was changed, and he's starting churches, and he's writing letters back to them about how to follow the way of Jesus. And here's what he writes to them. He says, and don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. And here's what basically Paul is saying, if, if I could put it in modern terms. Hey, when you hold a grudge, that grudge has a hold of you. When you hold a grudge, that grudge has a hold of you. The word that he uses here, the, 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 uh, it gives a foothold to the devil. That word devil is actually the, uh, the word for accuser. It's interpreted as accuser, which means that the longer you hold a grudge and the longer you go without resolving it, you actually allow the accuser to set up camp in your mind and in your heart. And now, in your mind and in your heart, you're, the accuser is living there and just accusing that other person. And isn't that true? Haven't you had this happen where you're holding a grudge against someone and now everything is through that filter and now you just constantly rewrite a story about them that they're just always the villain in every arena just to justify this grudge that you hold? Why is that? Paul says because it gives a foothold to the accuser. You're setting up camp for the accuser in your mind. You built a spite house and he starts to spit out stories about that person and your ill will and resentment goes deeper and deeper and deeper over time because the more you hold a grudge the more it has a hold on you. And this is just our sort of natural tendency when someone hurts us. This is what it is. Our first tendency is to return evil for evil. That's our natural tendency. It's eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, right? That, that's just the way that we tend to operate. It's human nature. Now, we all recognize we don't want to live this way, but if we're honest, that's, that's our first natural inclination. So what do we do about it? How do we stop holding grudges? How do we stop building spite houses? How do we stop this behavior? And my guess is that this last season has even more deeply entrenched in us a habit that sustains conflict and doesn't actually diffuse it. Um, my guess is and until we change this habit, we won't experience the unity that we each, that we want with each other or the peace that we want for ourselves internally. And even more importantly, we'll never be famous for what Jesus wants us to be famous for as a church, as followers of Jesus, if we don't figure out how to not hold grudges, how to not return evil for evil, then we're never going to love well the people that God has called us to love. Because it's impossible to love other people well the way Jesus has loved us when we're constantly holding on to grudges. And so the Apostle Paul writes in his letter to some followers of Jesus in the Roman Empire. And here's what he says. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. So he says, look, don't repay evil with evil. Now, here's what I appreciate is that the Apostle Paul doesn't, uh, he, he doesn't let them off the hook. He acknowledges what was done to you was evil. What was done to you was wrong. You have been wronged. So he doesn't say, hey, you know, just let it slide off your back. Just stop being such a baby. Uh, you know, get over it. He doesn't say anything like that. He says, no, uh, let's acknowledge that what happened to you was wrong. Let's acknowledge that you were wronged, that, that this is evil, what has happened to you. Whatever it was that, was holding, that, that you're holding on to, it was evil. And then he goes further and acknowledges what we all know. Your natural tendency and my natural tendency is to return evil with more evil. And we see this from early on in childhood. This is just human nature. When somebody punches you, you punch them back. Somebody knocks down your blocks, you knock them down, right? Someone insults you, you insult their mom. That's just how it works. And, and think about this. Like, like the, the, I pictured that this week. So my, my, uh, my son, who's 13... This goes back years, because we've been doing this for years. But over the last several years, we have spent an unhealthy amount of time trying to jump scare each other. <laughs> it's just what we do. And uh, so I don't know exactly when it started, but it's been years. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, I was uh, cleaning up some stuff in our yard, and it was, you know, it was bedtime, and uh, we had... We were playing bags out in the yard or something, and I was cleaning that up, and it's probably 9.30 at night, 10 o'clock at night. And, uh, I, I, and I saw, as I'm walking up onto the deck, I see him walking into the kitchen. The lights are on. And so I just, I went over to the kitchen window, and he's, like, doing something at the sink, and I'm two feet in front of him, outside, outside the window. And I just stood there, like this. 
for what felt like the longest time. And eventually he did see, and it got the best reaction I've had in so long. He almost fell over and spilled everything he had and, and ran out of the room like just terrified. And it was amazing. Uh, and, and by the way, this is called good parenting, if you're wondering. And so then I came in the house. I'm dying. I'm dying laughing. I'm like, this is amazing. This is the, one of the best scares I've done in a long time. And you would think the, the, that he would just go, hey, good job, great scare, now we're even. It never ends like that, though, does it? Jump scare fights and water fights, there's no end, right? It just, it just, there's no end. Somebody gets you with water, you have to get them back. Somebody gets you with a, you know, they, they splash water on you, you, you throw a cup of water at them, they throw a bucket of water at you, they throw you in a pool. Like, that's just, it just escalates, right? And so, uh, and so I went to check the garage, and, uh, and I'm still laughing about the fact that I scared him so bad. And then uh, he's in the bathroom next to our garage, into the, you know, the main floor bathroom. And I knock on the door, and I'm like, oh, I guess there's nobody in there. And so I turn off the lights, and I walk away, and he jumps out of the bathroom and scares me. And I'm like, ah! Like, dang it, you got me! Ah! Oh. So now I'm all wired up, you know, and I turn around the stairs to go upstairs and clomp up the stairs. Of course, I don't actually clomp up the stairs. I close the door to my bedroom. He thinks I'm in my bedroom. I go into his closet. (laughs) Amazing. And listen, this is going to go on until I'm about 85 and he scares me for one final time and my heart (laughs) stops beating. (laughs) Like, I don't see an end to this, all right? It's human nature. It's just human nature that things escalate. And never once, like, we're never going to get to the point where we just go, man, you got me good. Good job. Truce. We're even. It's never going to happen. And it's just human nature for us. Now, you know, it, it's fine because, you know, we both laugh about it now and, and, uh, and, you know, it'll keep going and we'll just keep laughing about it. And it's kind of, a, I guess, at this point, a father-son bonding thing. But... Uh, If we're honest with ourselves, we do the same thing with real legitimate hurts. And this habit of paying evil for evil doesn't go away. We might grow up and become a little bit more mature so our evil for evil looks a little bit different. We might ice somebody out. We might keep our distance in an unhealthy way. We might uh, uh, make comments about them behind their back. But barring intervention or drastic change, most of us have spent this last season either developing that habit or having it deeply entrenched in our lives. And God says... You need to break this habit. And here's why. Because evil for evil becomes evil for evil for evil. And then that becomes evil for evil for evil for evil. And then that becomes evil for evil for evil for evil for evil. And, you know, it just just gets longer and longer and longer. And some of you are just like, that looks like Twitter. That looks like the community Facebook page comments. Hey, that kind of looks like my workplace. That kind of reminds me of family reunions. That reminds me of when our extended family gets together. And some of us have had days that look like that. Evil for 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 evil where it's just back and forth. And some of us have had weeks like that or seasons like that. And some of us have had years like that. And here's the reality. We tend to build fences with our offenses. When we hold a grudge, not only does it hold on to us, but it actually separates us from the people, A, that we're called to care about, and B, that we're called to care for. And the longer we live this way, we actually wall ourselves off from the people in our lives that we're called to love. And we, when we hold a grudge, we build a fence, and we create an us versus them. We draw a battle line. We, we're saying, you're on this side or that side, and, and it's us versus them, and we, we build this fence with our offense. And some of us have allowed ourselves to be walled off from the people that we're called to care for, but we're too busy fighting with them to care for them. I love this proverb. It's not on your outline, but it says, love prospers when a fault is forgiven, but dwelling on it separates close friends. And some of you have built incredible walls to protect you, and as a result, you find yourself feeling isolated from the people that you care about. And here's here's the most difficult part about this. You're actually in the right. Like, they, they are actually 
in the wrong and you're actually in the right. And you're 100% right. And they did hurt you. And you didn't deserve it. And your story is justified. And if anybody had the right to do what you're doing because you're right, you have the right. And they're 100% in the wrong. They did offend you. They did hurt you. They did betray you. You didn't deserve it. And you are right. And you can be so right that you can write them right out of your life. And at some point, it takes humility to forgive. It takes humility to say, I'm not going to build a fence with my offense. Instead, I'm going to forgive. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to not allow that to come between us. Because at the end of the day, I still want relationship with you. Because at the end of the day, I'm called to love you. I'm called to care for you. But it takes a lot of humility to say, even though I'm in the right, I'm going to choose to extend forgiveness. But here's the reality. You can either choose humility now or you can choose regret later. You can either choose humility now or regret later. Because I know plenty of people who at, later on in life have regret because they didn't choose humility in the season when they could have chosen to restore a relationship. And now they're going, I would give anything to go back and be humble and choose to forgive, but now I have regret because I didn't restore that relationship. Even though I was right, I was so right that I righted them right out the door, right out of my life. And the Apostle Paul is suggesting an interruption to the evil for evil that we tend to fall into. Paul says, I just want you to decide you're not going to return evil for evil, that you're not going to try to get even, that you're not going to treat them the way that they treated you. And notice he does not say, live at peace with everyone. He says this, do all that you can to live at peace with everyone. As much as it depends on you, there are times where people are not going to reciprocate. There are people who, are, who will hurt you again and again and again, and you need to have some guardrails and you need to have some boundaries. But what's important is that when it comes to keeping score, you are not consumed to the point that you seek revenge or you try to demand payment. And then Paul continues and he says this, Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. And so the Apostle Paul is actually quoting from the, the law of Moses. And he's saying, look, when you decide I'm going to get even with this person, you are actually making a really big assumption. You're, you're actually stepping into the role of God. That's a big assumption on your part to step into the role of God. And when we are so consumed by a past injustice that it causes us to even the score, we're playing God. We're assuming the role of God and we're jumping the gun on his prerogative. And God says, I'll, I'll take care of it. And here's the reality. If we're, if we're thinking through this, you know, clearly, it rarely looks like we thought it would because usually God's primary objective is to make his enemies his friends. And when he makes my enemies his friends, he makes my enemies my friends. And I don't always like that, but I like that he did that with me. Isn't that interesting? I like that he did that with me. I don't always want him to do that with the people that I don't like or that I don't agree with or that have wronged me or that have hurt me or said something about me or betrayed me. But the reality is when God says he'll take care of it, more often than not, he's more interested in healing than in hurting. He's more interested in making his enemies his friends and in doing that, he makes them my friends. See, evil for evil is predictable. Good for evil is remarkable. Evil for evil is predictable. That's how everyone behaves. Paul says, this is, a, this is a way to live that is countercultural. He says, what I'm suggesting here is a way that is countercultural and not only gives you uh, freedom from carrying the grudge and gives you peace and joy, but actually helps you love others the way that Jesus loved you. So he continues. Instead, he says, here's the contrast. Don't return evil for evil. Do your best to live at peace with everyone. Don't try to take revenge. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you'll be heaping burning coals of shame on their heads. Do not overcome, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Do not be overcome by it, but you overcome evil with good. One way of paying evil for evil, our way of paying evil for evil, holding on to grudges, will pretty much ensure that evil will overcome us. The longer that we hold on to grudges, the more they have a hold on us. The longer that we hold on to grudges, we build fences with our offenses and we wall ourselves off from the people that we care about and from the people that we're called to care for. And the longer that we do that, we will ensure that evil will overcome us. 
that the hurt, that the wrongs, that the betrayals, that the words, whatever it is, that that will overcome us. And so the more it has a hold on us, I got to tell you, it's not the only option. We can overcome evil with good. Have you ever seen sweetness diffuse saltiness? Have you ever seen uh, a hug dissipate an argument? Have you ever seen an act of service thaw out icy tension? Have you ever seen owning and apologizing? Someone just saying, you know what? I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done that. I don't know what I was thinking. I'm wrong. Please forgive me. Have you ever seen that turn enemies into friends? And, and people meet in the middle and somebody has the humility to say, I was wrong. And somebody has the humility to say, I forgive you. I'm not going to try to get even. And suddenly the, a friendship grows where before it was battle lines. I mean, that's how you stop evil in its tracks. That's how you break the cycle of a grudge. When it's your turn, you don't keep building the fence. You start building a bridge. When it's your turn, you don't add another slat into the fence. You actually add another slat into the bridge. You go, you know what? I'm choosing to return evil with good. And when you do evil to me, I'm going to do good to you. And if you do evil to me again, I'm going to do good to you again. And when you keep doing evil to me, I'm going to keep doing good to you. In fact, no matter what you do, I've already predetermined that I'm going to do good to you because this is how Jesus behaved towards me and this is how I'm called to behave towards others. So as much as you hurt me, I'm going to keep doing good and I'm not going to build a fence with my offense. I'm going to build a bridge. And I'm going to keep building a bridge. And I'm going to keep, I'm going to live in peace. I'm going to do good. I'm going to do my part. I'm not going to let evil overcome me. And I'm not going to let evil overcome us. I'm going to keep building a bridge. I'm going to do good to you because you are someone that I care about. Or at the very minimum, you are someone that Jesus has called me to care for. We have to do better at building bridges than building fences. We've got to do better. And that can only happen when we decide evil will not overcome us, but we will overcome evil by doing good. Or to borrow the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. And hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. And somewhere along the way, somebody has to be the first one to say, I'm gonna lay my weapons down. I'm not gonna be the one who continues to build a wall between us. I'm gonna actually start to build a bridge. And our Heavenly Father did not overcome the power of sin and death and evil and in in force and hate and all these things. He didn't overcome any of that through more evil, through force, through coercion, through more darkness. God overcame the hatred and the evil and the darkness in our world through the light and the love of Jesus. And Jesus came into our world. And every time he was wronged, he absorbed that, and then he overcame evil with good. And every time that somebody said something about him, he absorbed that, and he overcame evil with good. Ultimately, he laid his life down, and in his final words, prayed, Father, forgive them. This is what it looks like to live in God's kingdom, and God is inviting us to join him and to let go of the toxic cycle of evil for evil in our families and in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, in our community in our schools, and in our nation. And we can start overcoming evil with good. Now, I recognize that it's easy to say that, right? It's easy to say, just, man, just overcome evil with good. Like, come on, Paul. This feels like a pretty JV answer to my varsity problem. Like, it's one thing to talk about it, and it's quite another thing to go out and apply this in our relationships, isn't it? Because here's what I know. In the different arenas of our life, right now, right here in this moment, I hope that you feel inspired. Like, yes, let's overcome evil with good. and That's great. But out there, when you get out into the real world and you're, you're dealing with, you know, somebody at your workplace, somebody in your neighborhood, somebody in your extended family, here's what it's going to feel like to actually put this into practice. When somebody hurts you, when somebody wrongs you, somebody says something about you, betrays you, to actually say, you know what, I'm not going to hold a grudge and I'm not going to build a fence with my offense. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build a bridge. And I'm going to return evil with good. It's going to feel risky. It's going to feel really, really risky because when you live this way, there's a chance they're not going to reciprocate. And there's a chance everything's not going to work out, but we have to remember it's not about them. It's about doing all that I can do to live at peace with other people. And though it feels risky, I can tell you, I think it's far more risky to allow a grudge to continue to grow unchecked and unfettered in your own heart. I think that's a far more risky path. Here's the other thing. It's going to feel unfair. It's going to feel unfair. 
It's going to feel like, well, why should I let them off the hook? Why should I let them get away with it, right? Why should I let them? And, and here's the reality. Whenever you forgive someone, whenever you choose to build a bridge instead of building a fence, the truth is your forgiveness is just as much for you as it is for them. It sets you free from carrying the burden of having to hold on to that grudge that now has a hold on you. That's just the reality. The other person is never going to deserve you to repay their evil with good. It's always going to feel unfair. But what is more unfair is that you would allow someone else to live rent-free in your heart and in your mind, that you would construct a spite house in your own heart, in your own mind, and allow somebody to continue to have a negative impact on your life and on your family and on your relationships moving forward. And we, are, we, we hold on to unforgiveness because we think if I forgive, it lets them off the hook. We, in our mind, we feel that forgiveness is for the benefit of the offended, for, uh, the benefit of the offender. But it's not. Forgiveness is for our benefit. Doing good for someone who has hurt us is actually for our benefit. And finally, it's going to feel weak. It's going to feel like someone's just running over you. Now, please don't misunderstand me. Hear me when I say this. This is not a call to let someone take advantage of you over and over again repeatedly. It's not a, it's, it's not a call to say, hey, you just have to let someone, uh, uh, if, if there's abuse that's going on, that's dangerous, and you need to, you need to create clear boundaries. You can still do good while keeping boundaries and guardrails in place. And this is not a call to simply let evil run rampant. And it's not like, hey, are you saying we should never take a stand? No, absolutely. Take a stand against evil. But we do that by living lives of love. That's how we take a stand against evil. So yes, when you live this way, it is going to feel risky, it is going to feel unfair, and it is going to feel weak. That's why so few people do it. But if we will choose to live with this counter-cultural filter over our conflicts we will experience a counter-cultural result in our relationships. They will thrive, and what we will discover is this is the secret to overcoming evil with good. This is the secret to making sure that we are not overcome by evil. Let me give you a final thought. For followers of Jesus, this is not optional. For followers of Jesus... This is not optional. When Jesus came into this world, it was risky, it was unfair, and he seemed weak. When Jesus came into this world, it was risky, unfair, and weak. And here's what the Apostle Paul tells us about Jesus and about his way of living life. He says, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. And he's talking specifically about our relationships with each other. He says, as you relate to each other, in, this, in the context of this letter, he says, as you relate to each other, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. That sounds pretty risky, pretty unfair, and pretty weak. It was incredibly unfair that he had to give up the privileges of heaven and incredibly weak because who would follow a savior that was put to death? You're not supposed to be able to kill the savior of the world. Seems pretty weak. And on the day when Jesus died, it seemed like evil had overcome good. It seemed like that was the end. And Jesus seemed pretty weak. But three days later, his strength overwhelmed the grave. And in doing that, death lost its hold on you and me. This is how Jesus loved us, and we have been invited into that way of life. If you are a follower of Jesus, at the cross of Jesus, you lost your right to withhold forgiveness. Because this is exactly how Jesus behaved towards us. And we've been invited into a kingdom and a way of living by a Savior who overcame evil through sacrificial love. And we've been called to do the same. And if you're a follower of Jesus, that means you forgive because you've been forgiven. We don't forgive because that person deserves it. We don't forgive because that person has earned it. We don't forgive because, well, they're just, they're just such a good person, really, you know, at their core. They're just a good person, so I think I can trust them this one. Listen. We forgive because Jesus forgave us. And here's the reality. You will never find the power and the strength to overcome evil with good by looking at the person who wronged you. You will only ever find the strength to live this way by looking at the one who has forgiven you. And when you remember 
the grace that has been extended to you, it makes it so much easier to extend that grace to others. When you remember the fence that we had built between us and God, and that God said, no, 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 I, I'm not going to build a fence. I'm going to build a bridge. And he came to us, and he gave his life for us. It makes it so much easier for us to take the slats in our fences and to build a bridge. When you realize all God has done for you, the, oh, that he overcame the evil in your own heart with his good, we're compelled to do the same. And when we do, not only will it impact our marriage and our family and our workplace and our neighborhood and our community, but we will be the people who become famous for what Jesus said we are famous for, that we will love one another well. And this is the best way to show our world that God loves them. It's not just to tell them, it's to show them. It's to show them. We have to decide we're going to build bridges instead of fences. And we do that when we're willing to overcome evil with good. Now, really, really quick, and then we'll close. I want to give you just really practical ways to live this out. Number one, and we'll, we'll throw this out on social media this week. Number one, go quickly and go directly. When someone offends you, don't talk about it sideways. Don't talk about it with this person, that person, this person. Don't post it on social media, okay? Instead, go directly to the person and go quickly and deal with them in person. Secondly, be quick to forgive. Be quick to renounce your right and your plans to get even. And instead say, you know what? I'm going to be quick to forgive. It's amazing how this one simple decision can completely change your demeanor towards someone else. Number three, own your part. Own your part. In almost every situation, there's a piece of the pie that belongs to me. So let's just be people who own our part, who acknowledge, hey, I'm not perfect. I make mistakes. I've done things wrong. There's evil in my heart, and I'm working on that. God's working with me. But let's own our part. Before I confront you with your part, I'm going to own my part. Number four, speak well of them. When everyone runs to their corners and everyone draws up battle lines and they're speaking ill of people who offended them, let's be the people who are speaking well of the people that aren't in our corner. Number five, let's serve them. This is what Paul said. Do good things for them. Uh, be generous in some way. Help them in some way with no strings attached. And number six, pray for them. Jesus said, Pray for your enemies. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. And then he said, when you do this, you are acting as true children of your Father in heaven. You want to know what it looks like to behave like God? You pray for people who have hurt you. That's the heart of who God is. And in doing that, you can start to build a bridge instead of a fence. So I want to challenge you this week. What is one arena of your life and what is one relationship in that arena that you know, man, I've got a little bit of a spite house built towards them. And would you this week start to pray for them every day? I'm going to just pray for that person. I'm going I'm to just ask God to do a work in me and I'm just going to pray for their benefit. I'm going to ask God to bless their life and see if that doesn't start to tear down the fence and start to build a bridge. And ultimately, ultimately, that's what God did for you and I. Jesus came into this world. We had constructed a fence between us and God. There was brokenness between us and God and brokenness between us and each other. And Jesus came and he destroyed those fences. He came into our world and he invites you into relationship with him. He built a bridge to us and he invites us to be a part of his family. If you've never said yes to the invitation to be a part of God's family, you can do that right here, right now. Just agree with this simple prayer as we close. God, please forgive my sins. Forgive me for the times I've walked away from you. I've, I've built fences between myself and you, myself and others. And I thank you that you tear down the fences and you build a bridge. And I want to say yes to the invitation to be a part of your family. Make me your son. Make me your daughter. And help me to follow you in your way of living life as best as I know how. I want to put my trust in you. So help me to follow you. And God, I pray for every one of us that these grudges that pop up in our own hearts, that you would help us not to build fences with our offenses, but rather that we would return evil with good. And in doing that, that we would overcome evil in that process, in our own hearts, and in our relationships with others, that we could truly be a church and a group of people as followers of you who are known by loving well. In Jesus' name, amen.